but I don't I really don't have any regrets I really don't I've I've lived exactly how I've wanted to I've tried my hardest every single time I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won or but I really gave it my all so that for me is enough Hi everyone, welcome back to The Body Surf. I'm James. I'm Jonathan. And this has been quite a weekend. This is unlike anything I could ever have imagined. <laughs> we were talking yesterday right after the women's final and kind of commiserating with each other about how how are we going to do this? Like, where, where do you even start with this? It's unprecedented. I think we're only just barely at a place where we've collected our thoughts somewhat to mm -hmm. be able to record this. Because... There's a, a fight against time. You don't want to wait too long, and then your takes become redundant. And or, also, or people are just too tired of exactly, hearing about it. Exactly, and they've listened to like five other podcasts about it. This coming out on Wednesday would have been untenable. So right. we had to get our shit together. But at the same time, putting out a podcast as kind of a knee-jerk reaction to what happened would also be really bad, potentially. Mm -hmm. Because our guttural, instinctive reactions to what happened might not be something we're proud of. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true, and we're going to talk about that. I feel that we have kind of come full circle in the slam season because we talked about Australia at the time, calling it the unhappy slam, and I remember thinking that this dark cloud had kind of descended over the tournament mm -hmm. with the Sandgren stuff, and there was just a lot of ugliness and a lot of uh, kind of sectarianism among tennis watchers, and... Compared to that, I feel like that big spaceship in Independence Day has blocked out the sun. Like, it's bigger than a dark cloud. <laughs> this is something that has me just really down, just really uh, kind of depressed about tennis. And which is the, the very unfortunate part about what happened in that women's final, because we had on offer potentially a mind-blowingly good event, mm -hmm. a feel-good, wonderful moment, regardless of who won. I was stoked for for the matchup. I was so excited that we were going to get Serena and Naomi in the final because Naomi was playing lights out. She was rising to every occasion during this tournament. And as we saw, she she continued to do so. Serena played so, I mean, almost perfectly against Venus, got herself together against Pliskova. I really thought we were we were watching the two best players of this tournament who were in form at the same time. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the good. Let's not get to the dark cloud yet. Uh, uh, the majority of this episode is going to be deconstructing the whole Serena mess. Right. Right? But we absolutely want to state up front, without reservation, that Naomi Osaka is here. She has arrived. Her star is born. And she earned every damn part of that U.S. Open trophy and mm -hmm. those $3.8 million. Right, which the USTA just needed to drop in there in that very, <laughs> very tense trophy ceremony. Well, they want to know, they want to make you be awed by the astronomical figure, mm -hmm. right? And But they also don't want you to know that it's a tuppence of what they generate <laughs> from the tournament. So if they're yeah. over here telling you, oh, $3.8 million, you're like, wow. But... well. If it were proportional. Right. <laughs> if we could see the income statement, please. One, one could retire on one U.S. Open title. But that's a story for another day. Mm -hmm. Naomi, it seems like we've been talking about her for a while, but she is still very, very young. I was almost surprised to be reminded that she was still only 20. Mm -hmm. I spoke to her in Charleston last year, 2017, and that too feels like three, four years ago. So she won Indian Wells this March in dominant fashion. She took out Simona Halep. She beat Kazatkina in the final easily. She went to Miami, beat Serena Williams easily. A couple days after winning the biggest title, well, at that time, the only title of her life, being a huge title, one mm -hmm. of the biggest in the game, she then has to go across the country to Miami and play Serena Williams in her very next match. Right. Primed for a letdown. And she beat Serena easily. Granted, we all know it was a Serena very early in the comeback and not at her best. But still, 
that was a match that was very losable for Naomi, and she <laughs> certainly right. did not lose it. So we're seeing this pattern that when Naomi is in form and feeling herself, she is very, very difficult to beat mentally. And this is not something that I thought was going to come so quickly for her. I witnessed her lose to Sakari in Cincinnati not playing well at all, and not, not really understanding how to think her way out of that match, getting out hit by Sakari. It's just, it's shocking how different she was there compared to the U.S. Open. Shortly before the U.S. Open, she released a message on social media saying, it's been very difficult for me this summer, the letdown of of being this champion and having the expectation after Indian Wells and not really enjoying being in that position. And that, and what followed was a string of first round losses. But then she said that heading into the US Open and Cincinnati, while you just said she didn't play well, she said she started to, to have good feelings again about her game mm -hmm. and enjoying the tennis again. And if that is not prophetic, I don't know what is. Right. <laughs> to then go on the tear of a lifetime in these past two mm -hmm. weeks. And in our preview episode, we did say someone could really sneak in in the bottom half of the draw. And we thought it was a great looking draw for Madison Keys. Mm -hmm. And she made it all the way to the semifinals. She did well with her draw and she ran into that buzzsaw, Naomi Osaka. Keys and Sabalenka. And they both mm -hmm. went as far as they could before not being able to get through Naomi. Oh, right. And the match of the tournament on the women's side was Naomi versus Sabalenka, which is just, it's a preview of what women's tennis could look like for the next mm -hmm. 10 years. I hope it is. Uh, it's a rivalry that I want to see again and again. And women's tennis fans were really pumped about it. She, I mean, in the previous match, she played the other up-and-coming Belarusian player and utterly destroyed her. Double bagel. I mean, no letdown at all. She took out both Belarusians. Sasnovich, six love, six love. Crazy. Mm -hmm. And then goes toe to toe with Sabalenka for three sets. The only time she was stretched to three sets all week. Takes out Serenko, who seemed to be a bit injured in the quarterfinals. I think she was ill. She said she woke up, I think, with a virus. But Serenko, who took out Caroline Wozniacki in the second round. Mm -hmm. And then Madison Keys, who was. In very good form. In beating Madison Keys, though, that was the f the first sign where you're like, maybe this isn't too soon for this to happen. Even though Serena would have been the opponent in the final, after watching Madison Keys, I, I absolutely thought this could happen now. Mm. Because she <laughs> saved 13, all 13 break points in that semifinal against Madison Keys. Madison was slow to start. The knock on Madison is that she can't troubleshoot through matches. Right. That she has one mode, one style of play, and if she's not able to find the court with her power game, then it's curtains. And that was true to an extent in this match, but as Madison came around in the second set and started to push Naomi and those chances came a knock-in, Naomi just cancelled every last one of them. It wasn't M Madison missing shots on these break points by and large. It was Naomi serving outrageous first and second serves, hitting huge from the baseline, audacious stroke play mm -hmm. to save these break points. And so we get to the final. Naomi is in scary good form, but of course people are still wondering, this is her first Grand Slam final, what, how is she going to be mentally? Playing her idol, who's going to show up? You know, we saw last year Madison Keys go against Sloan and just never got it together in that final. It was one-way traffic the entire time, and I didn't expect it to be like that for Naomi, but I did think, okay, she's going to be a little nervous. Well, you know, what do we expect in those first few games? What made this matchup so salivating was what was on offer. Serena had the chance to get to 24. She had the chance to get to 24 at Wimbledon, didn't show up against An Angelique Kerber in the final. This is her third slam back from giving birth exactly a year ago almost. Mm -hmm. So within 12 months, she's made two slam finals. And now at this tournament, it looked like she was very close to being fully back. And then you have Naomi Osaka, one half of this dichotomy of the old guard, the new guard, the all-time great, the ingenue, the, the hero, the one who looks up to her, two women of color, the past and the future of women's tennis. You could find so many narratives about this. After Naomi beats Madison in the semifinal, she gives this on-court 
interview where she was she was asked by Rinaldi, what were you thinking in those tough moments? And she's like, I just I was thinking I just really want to play Serena. <laughs> and we looked at each other. We're like, oh, shit. Oh, it's on now. <laughs> Our jaws dropped. <laughs> because she's so unassuming. Yeah. But she said it in her tiny little voice. And she is very introverted. She's uh, sensitive, right? And she just said flat out, I want to play Serena. And then she goes on to say, when Rinaldi asked, you know, do you have something for your to say to your mother? She's like, you know, thank you for everything. I love you. And then he says, and the message to Serena, I love you. <laughs> She's like, I want to play her, and I love her. All right. <laughs> so we get to the final. Serena didn't start slow. Like, she has been in the past few matches. Her first five or six games had been very scratchy in the first in the previous matches. But she kind of came out of the gates ready to go. I mean, of course, she was still making mistakes. She wasn't... I don't think she was moving nearly as well as she had been against Pliskova, against Venus. I think she was slow to the ball. And that may have been nerves. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a slow start score-wise because she was down a break on the first changeover. Right. But those first couple of games... But at least it, she held. It was <laughs> more to do with Naomi's play. Right. Because Naomi was not budging. If you were looking for nerves from a first-time slam finalist at 20 years old, playing your idol, it was not there. Right. So that was not something that Serena could rely on to, to have the time to work her way into the match because Naomi was firing from the beginning. I think Serena looked across the net and saw somebody a lot like her. She was facing a massive serve, someone with a big second serve as well, someone who could hit different spots in the box. But also once the rally started, Naomi was hitting these incredible angles, which are very Serena-like, and really going toe-to-toe and winning most of those rallies. Naomi's defense has improved so much. Her fitness is much better, her movement is better. It was just like, there's not much that this woman is doing wrong today. I remarked, and you tweeted about it, that this is like playing Kerber again, except she hits harder, and she serves like Serena. And yesterday she was serving better than Serena. And also, playing fearlessly like Serena has for most of her career, but not like we've seen in her comeback, Mm -hmm. necessarily. And especially when she's facing down another record. Yes. You know, we saw these nerves at 18. We're seeing it again when she's approaching the holy grail of women's tennis, tying that 24 slam mark that Margaret Court owns. The holy grail? <laughs> well, for her. And I know I got a lot of pushback about this. The record is suspect. Yes, I agree. But Serena values it a lot. She really wants to beat it. So for me, that's enough. Like, she thinks it's extremely important. That's one of the big reasons she's still out here, so that's enough for me. I don't think that's saying that Margaret Court is the best. She's saying, I want to put it to rest. Mm -hmm. What we saw was Serena was unable to hit through Naomi. And when she pressed Naomi, Naomi came back with bigger shots. Mm -hmm. And when you compared her play to Kerber, what really stuck out for me was Naomi being able to hit these short angles on the backhand, especially. There were a couple points in that first set where it really took me back to the 2016 Australian Open in that final. But as you said, with that much more power, it was, if you had to build a prototype of a tennis player, it was Naomi Osaka in that (laughs) final. Seriously. Right. Right. And uh, I mean, the backhand is supposed to be her weakness and she's improved that as well. And at this point, it's like, what what was she doing wrong? Mm -hmm. Like, was she doing anything poorly in the final? The one thing that is kind of her only weakness at this point is her net play which Mm. is likely what patrick was trying to get her to do with that coaching signal which we'll get into right (laughs) but before we move on in full to the theatrics of what happened toward the end of that match it has to be said and it's worth repeating that naomi played the match of her life in that Grand Slam final. Mm -hmm. For a Grand Slam final and preceding that, she played an impeccable two weeks of tennis. And there is nothing that should be said about her and her play to degrade her achievement. Oh, absolutely. We've been standing for a long time. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect it to happen this quickly, but it has and and we're here. And I strongly feel that Naomi is going to change this game forever, like profoundly and forever. 
she's gonna make so much money. What? It's, <laughs> that goes with that. She's gonna make. She's gonna be taking all that K money. K better watch his watch his back because <laughs> she's coming for his his wallet. When we were sitting down and trying to plan this episode, what was important to me is looking at what happened yesterday with empathy because I feel that a lot of the takes have been completely lacking in empathy. It's about who can share their opinion the fastest and in the most strident way. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of room for, well, a lot of things are going on and this is complicated. There's, and, there's not a lot of empathy for Serena. There uh, was a lot of empathy justifiably for Naomi. Right. And what became problematic was when I felt a lot of folks were cloaking whatever it is that was at play with them and their takes in, well, how dare this happen to Naomi and I feel so bad for Naomi and I'm going to use all the things that I've pent up against Serena for so long to then have it being impregnable. Mm -hmm. You can't push back against that because Naomi is now in this situation, which as we're here to tell you and have been here to tell you all along, multiple things can be true. Mm -hmm. And I realize that social media, tennis, Twitter is not is not a medium that's conducive to very complex arguments, just, mm -hmm. just because of the medium itself. But it was depressing to me, and I had to stay off Twitter for a lot of today because I just felt like most of the takes are dishonest. I just felt them to be disingenuous because you can see everyone kind of lining up in their fandoms and, and arguing kind of the most unsurprising things mm -hmm. it's like <laughs> you may feel this way but it is also totally predictable because you already felt this way before these events happened like you're reading it through your own lens your own biases yeah. and so it remains to be seen whether we are successful in avoiding that but we are at least going to try <laughs> because what we're attempting to do here is cut through a lot of that mess but to get to that point you have to at least be at a at a place emotionally and intellectually to be receptive to these ideas mm. right and what i found a lot was we saw so many people coming out of the woodwork so eager to justify their long held opinions about serena for the past the entirety of us being on tennis twitter and the duration of this podcast one of the pushbacks that we get a lot is, well, well, what about that time mm -hmm. with Shino? Didn't she threaten to kill an umpire? What about that time? And so no matter what Serena has done and how gracious she has been in losing, in winning, in whatever she does on a tennis court or in life during that time, it's almost like a vacation for these folks until they can find that next mm -hmm point to target because so now they have it now they, they have, have another it. anecdote yes. to confirm because what's at play and i wish people be more honest about it is that they don't like serena right right and for whatever reason be it i'm sure some of them it comes from a place of racism i'm not going to paint that brush widely but there are a lot more nuanced reasons why people don't like serena and they may not be aware of what those reasons are <laughs> you know whether mm -hmm. she just rubs them the wrong way and that's a very coded thing but also, you're not required to like Serena. No, you're not. But what we, what we got was, it was a lot of, this is her true colors. These are her true colors. This is who she is. She is a bad person. Mm -hmm. Let's just go through the facts before we get into this too deeply, just in case anyone isn't totally caught up. In, early in the second set of the women's final, Serena was called by umpire Carlos Ramos for a coaching violation. So it was her first first offense in the match, it was a warning. On TV, we could see that Patrick Muradoglu, her coach, was kind of making these hand gestures that the commentators interpreted as move forward, mm -hmm. like go to the net. It was kind of like a Novak boob throw, but just like pushing forward <laughs> right. horizontally. Right. So she was assessed a coaching violation, which absolutely incensed her. She argued in the middle of the game with Ramos, saying, I don't cheat. I would rather lose than cheat. I just want to let you know. And so at that point, it was pretty... She was clearly upset, but it was pretty subdued mm -hmm. compared to what came later. At that point, I was like, okay, you said your piece. You said it succinctly. Mm -hmm. Good for you. And, and we're going to move on. I and she even said, I know you don't know this, but I don't cheat. And I just wanted to let you know. 
And then it was kind of like, let's move on. Mm -hmm. It became clear later on that she was not moving on. Like she was, she was fixating on this because she felt that she was being accused of being a cheater. The next thing, out of frustration, she totally obliterated a racket, which I, I kind of felt was going to happen in the first set. Like I'm surprised it took her that long because it was frustrating. She was, I mean, she was well, she was in the second set. You know, she was fully in it. Her play had improved. She was challenging for the second set. She had broken Naomi. She had gone ahead and then mm. gave the break right back. Right. Smashed a racket, was assessed a code violation for racket abuse. Since it was the second code violation, that was a point penalty. She didn't realize it initially, was clearly pissed off about that. And now we're back at the coaching thing again. Because she doesn't believe that the first one was legitimate. She's asking for an apology, and it goes on. Demanding an apology. Well, right. <laughs> so you owe me an apology. Then... And Naomi goes up 4-3, right? On the changeover, Serena is speaking with Carlos Ramos again. She said he was a thief and he stole a point from her. And it was just this, you know, drawing at him. There was no there was no swearing. There was no, like, getting up in his face or anything. She was sitting in her chair complaining to him. She was pointing at him. That was the extent of mm -hmm. her aggression and also a raised tone. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even say she was shouting per se. It was, she was intense, and her, her tone was heightened, and mm -hmm. she was pointing. So then, the thing that shocked everyone, I think, including Naomi, including the biggest haters, <laughs> was that she was assessed a third violation for verbal abuse, and since it was the third, she was penalized a game. So now it's five three. Mm -hmm. Serena's to serve down a set and 3-5. She holds very quickly, like under a minute. Now it's up to Naomi to serve for the title. After all this, I mean, the crowd is booing. Just insanity. Nobody in the crowd, I think, understands what's going on because they don't have the benefit of hearing the commentators. Well, they can't of, hear A lot what... of them have the headpiece. Okay, in. But, but a lot of them don't. Okay. They also can't hear what's being said between Carlos and Serena. So, I mean, the crowd is insane. Booing... Naomi's got to go up against this and try to serve for the title, and she does. <laughs> and that's that. I, I mean, her winning seems so anticlimactic in comparison to what was going on in the stadium. The composure was stunning. Like, I cannot believe she did it. Mm -hmm. At every turn, she withstood everything, mm -hmm. this tournament. There was, there was not one moment of weakness shown by Naomi. Mm -hmm. Even when she was broken... It was after having saved a whole bunch of break points right. in that game, you know? So that's what happened. The one thing that we did learn throughout that whole thing is, in that instance where Serena is down 3-4 on the changeover, with Naomi about to serve, they would come back on court and Naomi would, in theory, serve and go up 5-3. Because Serena was docked that game, Naomi doesn't have to serve. Mm. So Serena served to get to 3-4, went on the changeover, and then immediately had to come back to serve down 3-5. So Naomi got mm. a game of not having to serve. Right. Which was something I was totally unaware of. It was new to me, fascinating even. Well, because when have we ever seen this mm -hmm. happen? It happens so rarely and never in a Grand Slam final. So those are the facts. I want to take some of the big themes or ideas one by one. Okay. So the coaching thing. This has been very popular on Twitter. Everyone has an opinion about the coaching thing. I have to say that you and I on this podcast have talked about mid-match coaching a lot lately because it's been kind of a pet interest of mine because when you go to tournaments in person, you see coaches, coaching players incessantly. That means, do you know what that means? That means not stopping. <laughs> That's what incessantly means. It happens in every match in any tournament that I've been to. Nearly every player. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the players actually interact with their coaches. Listen, let's, not, let's, not, beat, let's not beat around the bush here. Uh, <laughs> we were in Cincinnati and we watched multiple times up close, feet away from Kamau Murray and Sloane Stevens having full-on conversations. I mean, we see players walk to their box uh -huh. and speak to them in front of everybody. Yeah. I mean, anyone can see it if they're looking. The umpire can see it if they are looking. 
this is a matter of coaching from the stands because we know when it's not a grand slam coaches can come down on court and do the coaching thing and that's allowed mm -hmm. but even in even in those non grand slam matches you are not allowed to converse or get help from your coach within points but we've seen it blatantly and repeatedly ignored and not enforced like this, it's yeah. not understated it's not an understatement to say that the majority of tennis players get some assistance from their box yes tony nadal does it marion vider does it they all do it so from my perspective either you make it legal or you enforce it because the enforcement is clearly all over the place mm -hmm. so allow it and mary jo fernandez was saying she was frustrated by the lack of consistency in the calling and to be fair umpires have a lot of stuff to pay attention to yeah. during a match they can't always see it they don't have i mean they just don't have eyes everywhere in some instances it's very obvious sometimes the boxes are big <laughs> as in like the entourages in the boxes are big right or they're well placed so they can be seen easily sometimes uh -huh. they're not sometimes players aren't well enough known the coaches aren't a sasha Bain or patrick morata where mm -hmm. you can identify them so easily and so little signals or whatever you don't know what you're looking for or who you're looking for right but i think that we have to decide whether coaching is okay or it's not and, and you, you like, can't have different looks. You can't have a non-slam look and then a slam look. <laughs> right. And the WTA now clearly is in favor of on-court coaching. It's one of their, their gimmicks that they've introduced to the game in the last couple of years. That's not something they have control over at the Grand Slam level. Right. So we've seen now with their statement that they're, they're using this, this incident to push for doubling down on on-court coaching, <laughs> but that still doesn't address coaching from the stands. Uh -huh. Which is funny, actually, because Serena or Venus have never in their lives received on-court coaching. No. Never once. But they've both been called for a coaching violation by Carlos Ramos. By Carlos Ramos. And but Venus's was a soft warning. Mm -hmm. It was not a code violation. Yeah. But they were both indignant in their... Ooh. response in very similar ways mm -hmm. like the the ethos of it was exactly <laughs> the same and we talked about this on the podcast when it happened venus gave that classic line i'm 36 years old and never in my life have i been called for coaching so don't you try it right. i like that she mentioned her age mm -hmm. <laughs> so where do you stand on this well i'm i don't like encore coaching to be honest mm -hmm. i feel that since it's there uh sometimes it can be interesting sometimes it can be depressing i i mean if it's if we accept that it's a thing on the wta tour you might as well kind of pay attention and enjoy it every once in a while but i don't like it i don't like coaching from the stands i i just think it's you know it sounds like a cliche like that the players are out there on their own and they have to think through stuff by themselves i like that i like that about tennis it's an individual sport it's hard you know, so not only the best athletes prevail, but the the most mentally tough and the most clever sometimes are the ones who win. And I like that about tennis. And I want to keep it. So do I think that Patrick was coaching? Yes. I, that was obvious. On he the admitted replay. it. And he admitted it in that stupid interview while Naomi was accepting her plaudits and love from her family. Patrick Murata was on TV saying some dumbass shit. But that, that's beside the point. Yes, Patrick was coaching. Did Serena see it? I don't know. Does Serena need coaching or want coaching? Absolutely not. That I'm very, very confident in saying that Serena does not want to be coached. Because the, the first violation here was for the coaching violation. And as far as Serena's concerned, she was not coached. Right. Because she didn't see it. Like, even, through up to her, even up to her press conference, she did not know the extent of what Patrick had done, what he'd admitted to. Well... That's the thing. How much had been instigated by Patrick? Like this whole mm -hmm. thing started from Patrick. Because if, and I do believe that Serena doesn't want it. And, and so, she even says, I like to be alone out there. It's, you can imagine somebody as famous as Serena, and now who's a mother, that might be on the tennis court, ironically, the only kind of moments of silence to mm -hmm. herself that she gets during a day. And so the the shock afterward, I must imagine, when she learns the full hundred of it, of, mm. of, of, 
all that she went through because Patrick did this one yeah. little gesture. It all started. It all started with, with that, that. That little gesture. Now you told me about something that it didn't really occur to me immediately because I think we just you and I approach things from a different perspective culturally. Mm -hmm. So what what is the significance? Why was Serena so incensed by the accusation that she was a cheater? Why mm -hmm. did she go there? Again, understanding this from the perspective that Serena absolutely is convinced that she did not break a rule because she was not coached, mm -hmm. right? Me growing up and growing up in Jamaica, honesty was a huge, huge part of the social fabric, mm -hmm. the, the, the texture of being a Jamaican. And being around people of color, going to school in the States, having a lot of friends who are of color, like, and being immersed in, in similar cultures to Jamaican culture, like it's fairly universal and cuts across all borders that when you question somebody's integrity, that is absolutely one of the worst things that you can do. Mm. And so when, it, when Serena is saying that I did not cheat, people are like, well, it's Patrick said he coached, so you cheated. Like, it's a cut and dry tennis thing. Like, this is so far beyond tennis. <laughs> like, right. And I don't understand how so few people get this. Like, as you said, maybe it's just a cultural difference. Mm -hmm. But when, and I've experienced in my personal life, if somebody calls me a liar and I have not lied, you best be running for the hills. <laughs> because that is not something I will suffer lightly. Like, you will get the full extent of my tongue. Because it's, it's so out of line. Who are you in this world if you can't be taken for your word? It's some, I've said this on the podcast mm. before. Something my, my father in particular always said to his kids. He always said, you're only as good as your word. And that's what that boils down to. I get it. It is absolutely one of the worst things that you can say to somebody who is a person of color. And let's not also forget that from the moment the Williams sisters came on the scene, be it... Richard being accused of fixing matches that, you know, Indian Wells, that Venus allowed Serena to walk over into that final, be it the hair, the beads in the early days of their careers, that it was not part of the rules. Everything about the Williams sisters and the narrative surrounding them, and especially in the early parts of their careers, was framed in a way to kind of explain away their success and their excellence. There's also this idea to this day that people believe that Serena couldn't possibly have achieved all that she's achieved without the help of drugs, that they feel like she's a drug cheat. Her body is not normal. And there's all the other racial elements wrapped up into that. But from a cheating perspective, she's had to fight against people believing that she's always had an unnatural advantage against the rest of her opponents because she takes drugs. And so in many ways, Serena and Venus, for the entirety of their careers, have been fighting back against this idea that they're cheats, that somehow their greatness and their success has to be explained away by some factor that's giving them an advantage over somebody else and that it cannot be due to their the talent that they have, the hard work that they put in, that their parents had great foresight into raising them and training them a specific way that set them up for the rest of their careers. Yes, there's this idea that I just talked about, questioning somebody's integrity is a huge slight against a person of color, but it also exists, this incident exists against the backdrop of the entirety of their careers where they've been having to push back against people feeling that they're cheats and liars. This, what you know, when you brought that up yesterday, it had me thinking about people who are criticizing most stridently are people who, who presuppose that we all come from the same place, that mm -hmm. we all believe the same things, that we all have the same standards, that don't understand that we react to things differently, that we act, react to invocations of the rules differently because there are many instances when the coaching thing would have been a soft warning would have been like listen serena you, this needs to stop mm -hmm. and umpires do that all the time in almost every match you know they say whatever this is that that can't happen again if a player curses rather than going to the code violation first it's like 
uh, a kind of a little heads up. If you do this again, we're gonna be we're gonna have a big problem. It doesn't always happen, and umpires have different ways of dealing with those situations. Mm -hmm. But we've we've seen and we've seen some receipts that Ramos himself has not been entirely consistent in the distinction <laughs> between giving out a violation or giving a soft warning. And that's mm -hmm. right because we firmly believe that as a tennis umpire you have so much discretion at your disposal. And in this instance, in a Grand Slam final, it would behoove you to exercise as much as possible where possible. And for us, this was very possible. Right. And so that brings us to kind of another big thing that I want to talk about. This rules are rules crowd. <laughs> like you said, Ramos is seen by a lot of people as being very strict, being not afraid to take on the top players, assess violations to them. But we have also seen other instances when players have gotten away with just really bad things. And not with other umpires, I'm talking about with Carlos Ramos. Mm -hmm. Nick Kyrgios telling him to his face that his call is fucking bullshit. <laughs> you know? And there was, there was no violation assessed for that. That was just like, okay, just go away, get on with the match. And Novak Djokovic has gotten in his face and, and not been has assessed. him. For a line yeah. call at the French Open. Yeah, has literally made physical contact with him. So why was this different? So when I say rules are rules, there's a lot of people out here saying, well, she broke rules and he was within his rights to assess those violations. And that is true. Did she, did Patrick coach her? Yes, that's yes. true. Did she smash her racket? Yes, she did. Did she call him a thief? Which, and we were, were given this fairly universally from the people in this camp the rules about the rules are rules people that camp they sent around the the actual letter of the law the tennis rule book mm -hmm. where it actually says like if you call the umpire a thief or question well, their question his honesty or integrity uh -huh. or then it is a violation okay fine right. those th those three things are true however the... <laughs> i posit <laughs> that if if you can make it through life, living rules are rules, come what may, then A, what kind of life are you living? B, you clearly have no concept of the fact that rules are made by people, people who are subjective, and thus rules are also subjective. Mm -hmm. And rules are not often just. Rules are often archaic. Rules often need to be changed. They need to be challenged. And I just don't understand how one can take such a militant, hardline stance. Championing rules when we are playing a tennis match with so much context surrounding it. Mm -hmm. There is the letter of the law and there is the spirit of the law. It's, it's the things that the rules are meant to accomplish, right? I just, this ties into my feeling that a lot of these takes are not intellectually honest. Because when your favorite players do these things, how vocal are you in criticizing them? My apologies if you were out here in 2009 screaming that your favorite Roger Federer should have been given a code violation for verbal abuse, because by the same standards he should have when he cursed at Jake Garner throughout that entire changeover in the US Open final. If you were out here talking about that, my apologies. But I suspect that you weren't. And the thing with the rules is that the umpire is given a lot of power to decide when to, to enforce them and when not to. And I think that's a good thing. I think that otherwise we would just have robots being umpires, and I don't want that. I... This is the same tournament. The last episode we brought to you, we spoke about Muhammad Layani and how his discretion went too far. <laughs> <laughs> and that he came down out of his chair to coddle and boost Nick Kyrgios. Yeah. So the, the juxtaposition is just too much. It's wild. Like, it's too that much. That these two <laughs> things can happen within the space of a week and a half. It's too much to be believed. Mm -hmm. So, I don't let... See, I'm trying not to get gaslit here. Because, yes, I am here on this podcast acknowledging that what Ramos did was within the rules... And according to the letter of the law, Serena broke those rules. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is true. But what is also true is that this is a situation where you could have diffused. You could have explained what was going on if it were possible. 
I don't know if Serena was, at that point, amenable to it. But there was zero, zero attempt to defuse the situation. It was the stark opposite to the Liani Kyrgios thing. Is there, is there something in the middle? I'm not saying he needs to get down there and hug her. When you consider that had that, had he just ignored that little push from Patrick, had he just said, okay, listen, maybe a soft warning, mm. or even if he hadn't like said anything, say, say well, there was no first violation. The first violation then becomes a smashed racket. And the third one possibly never happens because Serena is not incensed about her character being questioned. Right. You know, and these are things we can't know. Like, we can't know what would have happened at 4-3 in the second set because a game was taken. We don't know. We don't know if Serena would have continued to escalate if he didn't call one of those violations, mm -hmm. the second or third. We have no idea. And that's my point. Like, Naomi Osaka won the U.S. Open title, but there are a lot of unknowns floating around there. And I feel that the umpire took control of a match in a way that he did not have to. That's it. Not that Naomi didn't earn her title, which she did, but that there were so many other more human ways to handle it, which we see in tennis matches all the time. I'm not asking for special treatment. And it's not that Serena's without fault. We'll get to that in mm. a little bit. I also want to know, these rules are rules, people. Are you also, when you get stopped doing a 65 in a 60 and given a <laughs> ticket... You're like, you know, officer. Like, good. You know what? Good for you. I will gladly pay that I deserve fine. it. I absolutely deserve it. I should have been driving 59 miles an hour. Just <laughs> under the speed limit just to be safe. You know, it's, it's so disingenuous to me. Like, rules are rules when you're in high school. When you're... <laughs> I went to a high school where you had to wear uniforms. Rules were very important. Mm -hmm. And that shit stems from uh, colonialism. It's like, <laughs> it's designed to keep people in order, to keep the masses mm -hmm. in check. One survival depends almost on challenging rules. <laughs> in this case, not necessarily so. No. <laughs> But, but I, when you imbue rules with a power that's almost supernatural, exactly. that it's not of this earth, that people didn't sit down and decide what they should be. Precisely. You and know? we say this all the time, like stuff that you think about in your regular life, you then don't apply them to sport because sport is pure and extra social. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it exists outside of society at large. It's like this magical being where everything is pure <laughs> and we right. must protect its sanctity at all costs especially from the black woman wagging her finger from a safe distance with a slightly elevated tone at the umpire. Hmm. I think that brings us into the next thing that we have to talk about. Serena leveled the accusation once the tournament referee came out that this would never happen to a man. I was, I was honestly shocked that she went there, and I felt like at that point it was over because there was no chance... There was no chance that she was going to turn down at that point. She was in tears. The match was still going on. And there was no chance that she was going to be heard at the same time. It, there's just no way. Like, it's not happening in the middle of a match. Clearly, the umpire is not going to respond to it. He's not going to apologize, and he can't revoke the violations. He's already assessed her. Uh, it was just, at that point, I was really sad, and I wanted it to be over. If Naomi was to win, I wanted her moment to be special. And I didn't want it to be clouded by all this. But that being said, was she wrong? Like in the actual substance of what she said, it wasn't the right place to say it. And she could have turned down, and she didn't. But was the substance of what she said wrong? And I think that's, at this point, it's, I'll answer my own question. We can clearly see that, no, she's not entirely wrong. It may not have been right of her to say it then. Uh huh. It happened in two stages. She said, if a man were to do this, it wouldn't be the same. And men say worse and they get away with it. Those are things that we say on this podcast all the time. Right. Those are things that are generally accepted as true, mostly universally. I think, I don't think that's a hotly contested issue amongst well, most camps. Be but the, no, but no, no, no. But the moment Serena then says, this is sexism, that's when it's, it becomes a totally different scenario for mm -hmm. me right because people receive it differently 
It's when you exhibit ideals and behaviors akin to feminism. But the moment you identify as a feminist, that becomes an issue. It becomes a point of contestation. Mm -hmm. Like you can say things that are perfectly reasonable and and Mm -hmm. make logical sense, right? But when you say, this is that, when you identify it, because those words are powerful. Sexism is triggering for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. When you break it down without the labels, it makes sense to people in a lot of ways. But then when you give it the label of feminism or sexism, then it becomes, well, something is being taken away from me. Right. You know, like you are, you're challenging my privilege. And that, in this instance, was absolutely not, I hate to say right, but the right place and the time for Serena to have made that pivot. No, it wasn't the right place or time. Um, Watching it, having been a fan for, I don't know, since 1999, like that's a long, long time. You know when Serena is kind of melting down. Mm -hmm. And it it made me sad because I knew she wasn't going to get it back. Like I knew that the match was done at that point. And regardless of the validity of what she was saying, it wasn't going to be heard and it wasn't the time. And now it's given ammunition to people to say, Serena says she lost because of sexism. And that's clearly not what she said. And so it give, it allows you to forget everything else that happened. And that's not her fault. She basically cuddled Naomi through the trophy presentation. She praised her. She said the crowd, you need to stop booing. No more booing. Like this is her moment. She did the thing she was supposed to do after, but it was such a bizarre situation that it was hard to it was hard to see it as magnanimous. So people are not going to remember that when they look back at this match. It might not even be written about 20 years from now, but she did those things. What they're going to remember is Serena living up to what a lot of people view her as, as this angry black woman, as, pardon the, the phrase, but a black bitch. Mm -hmm. That's what people believe she is. They have painted her as animalistic for over 20 years. And now they have just one more anecdote to say, look, this is your fave. This is your goat. This is how she behaves on an international stage. This is not to pit women against each other, but just a simple thing like how Caroline Wozniak is received as opposed to how Mm -hmm. Serena is received in a lot of instances. What is it about Serena that it's that much more offensive? Like, sure, you want to say Caroline did not say to Shino, I'm going to stuff this ball down your throat. Okay, Mm -hmm. that's one example. But what is it about Serena that's endured over all these years in spite of the alleged and what we believe to be growth that she's shown over the last seven years? Meanwhile, Caroline has regressed on a week-to-week basis. Mm -hmm. But... The way she's viewed is totally different. What makes Serena aggressive and Caroline standing up for what she believes in? Mm. Why is it amusing when Plishkova attacks the umpire chair while the umpire is sitting in it? Mm -hmm. Like, why is that cute? That was a branding opportunity for her. She laughed about it after. Like, she thought it was good for her image because she's seen as robotic. Like, what? What is going on? And so when you tell me that race has nothing to do with it, I don't know what was going through the umpire's head. I'm not sitting here saying that he is racist. No. But I'm saying that you cannot see this situation outside of blackness. Because Serena is black. And I don't care if you don't get it. If if you're not from the United States and this, our racial mess doesn't make sense to you, that's fine. I don't expect you to be a student of history. It doesn't make sense to a lot of Americans as well. (laughs) Right. But the fact that you don't get it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist or that it's wrong. Not that you just don't get it. You don't see it. Mm -hmm. And what does it take for somebody to see it? You know, what Mm -hmm. were the things that made us see it? You know, Um, well, I'll go back to empathy. For I mean, I grew up with the the, all the privileges of whiteness. You did not. and, And you don't in North America, you know, so we're coming at this from a different place. Serena feels victimized at the US Open. Mm -hmm. That's a pattern that is clear. So I can't possibly understand that, but I do understand that as a black woman who has both been done wrong by and did wrong at the Mm -hmm. US Open, she was wrong about Chino, but she was totally screwed by that 2004 quarterfinal against Jennifer Capriati. I can see that multiple things are going on here. I can see that black people who are consistently over-policed, punished more 
harshly for the same crimes, stopped by police more. If you if you don't want to see that these things all exist in the same universe, like I, I just don't get it. That, I'm not saying like that somebody would bring that baggage with them right. to a tennis court. And it's not like this is criminality. Like what Ramos did is not the same thing. No. And I know somebody will oversimplify this and take words out of my mouth. But you have to understand like a black woman in America might see it that way because she can't just let it go. Like she can't just take that baggage off while she's on the tennis court. Does that make sense? Serena, you're talking about specifically? Yeah. And also her fans who are of color as well. Mm -hmm. Because they bring their lives to their fandom of her as well. Right. So the army, I mean, the army can be very wrong, very loud and wrong. That that certainly does happen. But I tend to be a little more understanding because I get that this is a fandom that is predominantly black and they get a lot of other fandoms saying the army is horrible, they're disgusting, they're xenophobic, they're bigoted. And like these might be people who are new to tennis, may not be, but we want tennis to be a more diverse and accessible place. At least we do. I know a lot of people don't. But Serena fans are fans too. Like they like tennis too. You know, it's it's not that they're here just for Serena. It's almost as if some of these naysayers are, are out here salivating that, aha, this is the moment. This is the one moment where you cannot bring race into it. Like I've got you, I've got you cornered. Mm -hmm. This is the time when you are just that disgusting black bitch that I always knew you were. Mm -hmm. Nobody's being racist toward you. You're showing your true colors. That's what it boils down to for me. People want to essentialize Serena as this stereotype, one that looks familiar to them. They may not know why or where it comes from, or even if they're told about the angry black woman stereotype or all the ways in which black people are oppressed. They don't see it in their lives. They can't understand it. And they're not willing to give that leeway because of it. And mm -hmm. so when you're presented with the opportunity to, to justify your gut reactions to this woman, that you don't, you can't even really make sense of yourself, you know? Right. And you're not re willing to grapple with what it means about you and your privilege and where you've come from or whatever and the way you see the world if somebody were to bring that argument to you. You would rather just boil, boil this down to a basic, that is Serena, she is... That is who she is. She's a sore loser. She's a horrible person. And this is what I've always known. Mm. Fuck everything else that I, not me, but these people, I've been force fed to believe and be quiet about these last few years. She could do whatever it is. It doesn't matter. But I've got this moment now. Mm -hmm. And that, that goes back to that intellectual and emotional dishonesty that we were talking about. Because multiple things are true. Serena absolutely could have de-escalated. The reasons why she got heated in the first place might not be a reason you can understand. <laughs> but it sure as hell is not just a rules are rules kind of situation. Mm. And she smashed a racket. What is different about that from what the majority of tennis players do? Yes, it's a, it is, it is a, an infraction. You know, but like the cumulative effect of these rules being broken brings us to the destruction of a Grand Slam final. And then it's mm. all meant to be put on Serena's head. Well, now we can fully blame it on Serena. Like, that's where yeah. we're at. And that's, yeah. I think, how history will see it, is that she self-destructed, she's a sore loser, she ruined this for everybody. And I don't necessarily see it that way. I know in my brain that she could have handled it differently, but that's not entirely what happened here. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that the people who don't like Serena or, or who think she's a sore loser, that they're all racist. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying... No, I think it's the refusal to to understand that racism exists and that... That it can exist in sport as well. Yes. That sport is not a vacation from racism. Right. And racism, like, it doesn't have to be, like, Carlos Ramos wasn't sitting there like, wow, I hate this black girl. She's talking to me like this. What a bitch. It's not like that. Like, that's not how this works. What is going on unconsciously? What brought him to that level? Because Serena was already at a 10. Mm -hmm. So what made him, rather than attempt in any way to diffuse the situation, to put like a human touch on the umpiring, like another umpire might have done, why didn't he de-escalate? 
If a player is escalating, why are you not de-escalating? That's it. We also wanted to talk about this idea that Serena does this whenever she's lo losing. And you wanted to situate this specifically as a New York thing, as a U.S. Open thing. <laughs> it is. Uh, I mean, she just lost the Wimbledon final to Angelique Kerber, and she could have done it there, but she didn't. She lost the Australian Open final to Kerber a few years ago, the French Open final to Muguruza. There was none of this. Like, there, there were no histrionics at all. She's lost a lot of finals. She's been out here for a long time. So what is it about New York that, uh, that brings it out of her? Because it does seem like she is, is ready in New York. Like, there's always... She feels that she's been victim, victimized in the past, so she's, like, ready to escalate quicker than she would be anywhere else. Yeah, because in, in a lot of ways, she feels that she didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And we don't think that that's true. No, because she should have stopped, like, a while before, before the verbal abuse thing. I mean, not just in this instance, but with the Shino thing, you know, like there. No, been... clearly she was at fault in in the foot fault situation. Yes. Yeah, and in the Sam Stozer situation as well, when she was called for a hindrance, which happens but is not super common, she was surprised by it but could not let it go, and she was being outplayed in that final. And people see it as a similar situation. She couldn't accept that she was losing, fair and square, right? And so she let Ava Azdraki have it and was not assessed a code violation like she was in this match. But there's something about New York that, it, like, she's ready to fight sometimes. Figuratively. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, this was like a different, kind of like a maternal Serena. She was still angry, but it was different than it had been in the past. Mm -hmm. I also don't feel like she has the full set of tools to really grasp with her stature outside the game as well. Like Serena is a legendary figure within tennis right now, but she's so big outside of tennis, something that's grown exponentially in the last couple of years. And she's taken on these social justice causes that I don't think that she's necessarily equipped to separate that person from the person who just really wants to win in those high pressure mm. moments. Mm. And we saw the conflict and the friction between the two when she pivots to the men wouldn't be treated like this. Right. It's true. I believe it to be true. But the way she went about bringing it into play, I could see the, the tension between those two Serenas at play in one moment. Mm -hmm. Like you can say something that's true, but it's not coming from a good place uh -huh. and in her press conference she went on kind of an extended monologue about feminism basically and while a lot of the things she said was true i don't know that it was entirely selfless <laughs> you know that's the thing is top athletes are incredibly selfish and they have to be so their politics are not always completely motivated by altruism Mm -hmm. Even if they can accomplish good things, it's not like like it might be self-interested. Do you know what I mean? And it, it can also be, on a sinister level, a way to change the narrative and the headlines. Oh, yeah. And the, here is where her team is really bothering me a lot. We have, you know, Jill Smoller and a bunch of people in her team were in the press conference and they were applauding at the end, so much so that myself and a lot of people thought some, some members of the press were applauding her speech, which was stupid of me, I realize. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was weird. Because we've been in Serena press conferences and we've seen that she doesn't come alone. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's always at least Isha in there, but apparently there was a whole group this time because of the circumstances. The other thing is that you have Patrick Muradoglu giving this interview to Pam Shriver right after the match, before the trophy ceremony, blaming everybody and their grandma about what happened when it was him who started the whole thing. He admitted on TV that he was coaching, but, and there were so many buts, they were like, well, Sasha coached in this very match. Tony did it all coaches all the time. Da 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 da. It's like, Patrick, shut up. I mean, if I were Serena, I would be incensed. And I hope that she is. I don't I have no idea how 
how that's going on in their team. But I was so disgusted because now Naomi Osaka is the champion. She won fair and square. And you're going on TV complaining about how, yes, I coached, but it was unfair. What? Like just tra absolute trash behavior from Patrick. I'm so disgusted. And as a fan, as a Serena fan for a long time, if that's the kind of thing that she wants around her, I'm disgusted by that too. And in that moment, this might be a, a bit of a tangent, but we saw in full effect how conflicts of interest in tennis are problematic. Because Patrick is out here working for ESPN. Pam has a hotline to Patrick <laughs> mid-match because there's that connection. Mm -hmm. She can get him on air. Also because Patrick loves nothing more than the sound of his voice. He likes to be that person mm. who is giving opinions all the time. And to then cut to him to explain it, it's, it's timely, it's newsworthy after the match. But then the net effect is taking away from Naomi's moment even more. Again. Again. Right. When, in fact, there's nothing you can tell me to dissuade me from thinking that Naomi was going to win that match regardless. Mm. You know, and so the net effect is that this was so unfair to Naomi. Like, <laughs> and this is where multiple things are true. You dissect and you talk about the Serena thing, the coaching thing, the violations, Patrick, whatever, all that stuff. It doesn't mean if you have... A, to put it on a very basic level, a pro or supportive opinion of Serena in that regard, that doesn't mean that you're then not supportive of Naomi. Mm -hmm. Because Naomi was absolutely hard done by the situation. To think that you get to your first Grand Slam final to play your idol, you're 20 years old, you play out of your mind, you back up what you've done the last two weeks, and then you're met with a situation that's unforeseen. It's totally unforeseen. There's no planning for it. You've played no part in making this happen. And you've had your winning moment spoiled. Mm -hmm. You'll forever live with that the rest of your life. And then you get to the trophy presentation ceremony. And then there are all these boos. And part of the intellectual dishonesty that we talk about is that folks are out here saying that because of what Serena did, the crowd booed Naomi. And Serena needs to take responsibility for that because she ruined Naomi's moment. There's a lot of cause and effect there that isn't, isn't true. Right, or is tenuous. Exactly. The crowd was absolutely booing the moment. It was a shit moment. Everything that mm. happened was shit. <laughs> it was horrible to watch. Uh -huh. It wasn't fair to Naomi. That is true. And if I were her, I could understand thinking that those boos were for me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that may not have been the case, but I, I can see how how difficult it must have been for her to accept this U.S. Open trophy under that sort of atmosphere. You it dream all your life of winning this title, getting this moment, and then you get there, and then it's not what you expected. And not only is it not what you expected, it's horrible. Right. Like, everybody's on stage with their pants down, not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Tom Rinaldi introduces the thing... And there's, what, 14 seconds of booze, silence. Everybody's just looking around, not knowing what to do. Uh, I think you, people say that Serena was great in this moment and comforted Naomi. I don't know what I would have done in that situation, mm. <laughs> being Serena. But to me, as an onlooker, and this may be unfair to her, I think I'm in the minority of the people who are in the middle and thinking that she waited too long. Oh, like you felt she should I have done like more? I felt like she should have done more, yes. Hmm. And I think it took too long. But how how do you have that self-awareness in the moment? You right. know, like it clicked to her at some point. Because she felt very strongly that something was taken from her. Yeah. Not necessarily the title, but the opportunity. I imagine that she's still in her feelings about that. She's processing stuff that she's just said about pivoting to social issues like mm. there's a whole lot going around in her head as well and to then make space for Naomi which we think is like the natural thing to do right. might not make sense to any of us in that moment if we're Serena mm. and so perhaps it's a bit unfair for me to say that it took her too long but I'm kind of side-eyeing these folks who are out here saying Serena handled that with class <laughs> oh okay. okay parts of it were classy yes but like to to <laughs> paint that broad brush and say like it was an A-plus performance. I, I just don't know. 
Mm. I, I, I don't know. Mm. I, I feel you, pretty much everyone feeling for Naomi in that moment. What I have to urge you not to do is to infantilize her. Because she is a grown woman. She's tough. She's shown that multiple times now. She's tough. And she has a really, really good team around her. People who love her and support her. So let's not treat Naomi like she's a helpless baby. Because she's a grown woman. We talked about the angry black woman trope. And something that that rubbed us the wrong way is a lot of folks out here who have this visceral reaction to Serena. But yet they're the same ones who are... Well, I know where you're going with this. Who use black women for entertainment. Not only that, but then they revel in the whole, can I speak to your manager Mm. scenarios. (laughs) You know, like you mock white women for how they handle confrontation. But yet when you have a woman, a black woman being very direct about her feelings, it's total opposite end of the spectrum. And then in a couple months, maybe, maybe even a couple weeks, we'll be getting gifs and memes of this whole situation in a playful manner. Mm -hmm. No, but like... These are the same people who are using Tiffany Pollard gifs from reality TV, but are like deeply, deeply offended by how Serena Williams acts. Mm-hmm. It's like it's weird. It's who talk like, about cis and fam and right. feel like they have like, entitlement to the can vernacular. We, can we rewind for a second? Because as a white person, I would never, ever call somebody cis. Ever. <laughs> it is weird. And it's offensive to me. And, like, if I called a black person cis, you see, like, white women calling black men cis. This is something that Kim Kardashian has popularized. You might get hit. (laughs) And you would probably deserve it. That's a tangent. But don't use black women's messiness for your entertainment and then condemn at the same time. Yes, that was very succinct and to the point. Thank you. So to recap, we'll bang the drum again that multiple things are true. And for this particular instance situation these things are so serena probably should have turned down probably should have probably she should have de-escalated even if she was angry because not only did she affect the the direction of the match she took opportunities away from herself Mm -hmm. we believe she was put upon by the umpire and his handling of the situation But she also has agency in that situation. And I think that's where a lot of folks have difficulty reconciling a lot of the stuff that we would have said in support of Serena on this episode. Because we always want to see people take up accountability for their actions. Being the GOAT, being Serena Williams, being this cultural icon, everything you do has meaning. And you don't just get to have the benefits of when things go totally right and in your favor you know like you are you are steering that ship and so while patrick did a lot of messed up stuff while the umpire should have used a lot more discretion in our opinion like serena still has a lot of control over that situation and what we saw was she was unable to maintain any control Mm -hmm. the other thing naomi played crazy she came to her first grand slam final to fight and to win and the game plan was there, the execution was there, like she won. That, she, that's she not played a better than Serena. Yes. That is not contestable. Mm-hmm. And her mental state, her composure to serve out that final was wild. It's something I couldn't even have predicted. Next, the umpire, umpiring is an incredibly complicated undertaking. Everybody has an opinion. Not a lot of us have expertise, including us. We are trying, (laughs) you know, we're trying to get it. But umpiring is very complicated. Mm -hmm. In this situation, the umpire made choices. Choices, some of which that we, some of which we disagree with. That's it. Like, that's the simplest way I can put it. But you know what's helpful? Whenever something happens umpire related, a lot of tennis Twitter turns to Victoria Chiesa. Mm, Well, everybody. Yeah, as a (laughs) former umpire. (laughs) And somebody who has actual expertise in the field. Mm -hmm. She's very nice. Ask her a question. But ask it nicely, you know? But my point is, we are force-fed former coaches, former players, 
a lot of people commentating, ourselves included, we put ourselves in the mix, mm -hmm. having a podcast, who are tasked with giving opinions on what's going on in tennis. And when it relates to umpiring, it would be helpful to have the perspective of somebody who's actually done it. And we never get that mm -hmm. in an official setting. And we've made mistakes before. Yeah. Like we, we've had takes that we're not proud of. A lot you of know? the stuff we may have said on this episode might not hold up for us even <laughs> by next week. Right. So, might just delete this from the cache. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's something that could and should be added to the tennis landscape going forward. And then the final thing is that you may not want to accept that race and gender are a factor here. I think they are. I don't think it's as, it's not as cut and dry. It's not as cause and effect as some people want you to think. That's gaslighting. It's messy. This is mm. a messy situation. There are a lot of things at play, a lot of things that are not tangible. It's difficult to pinpoint. It doesn't mean that these things don't exist. And we need to be intellectually open and honest and emotionally open to consider these things and not be uh, so quick to twist the knife and rake somebody over the coals. Okay. So we only spent, you know, a good hour on that. Not, not very long. Other things happen at the U.S. Open. The men's final today, Novak Djokovic won number 14, tied Pete Sampras. This record that Pete Sampras set in 2002 was not supposed to be beaten. Rest in peace, uh, Pete Sampras' I mean, records. This record has been beaten by three men in the past 16 years. It's crazy. And the oldest member of that generation didn't even win his first major until Pete Sampras was done. After Pete Sampras won that record. So in the span of, you know, 2003 to 2018, three men have done it. It's wild. Novak played, I mean, real, like just played infallible lights out tennis today. I told you yeah. from before championship weekend that we will head into Roland Garros with a Novak slam on offer. Well, I, six Australian Open titles do not lie. <laughs> you know, there is a very, very clear cut favorite for the Australian Open that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Juan Martin Del Potro played a wonderful two weeks here, acquitted himself well in the final, but it he really couldn't do much to get through Djokovic's amazing defense and returning. Djokovic's serving was very difficult to overcome. He was broken twice in this match. The second set was actually very exciting. There was a 20-minute service game that Djokovic eventually held. And at that point, you felt like, you know, Del Potro is still in this, but losing that, that many chances to break is so demoralizing. If somebody can overcome it, Juan Martin probably can. But unfortunately, he didn't. He lost the second set in a tie break. And the rest is history. It didn't really seem in doubt after that. These courts are very slow. And like, Jim Courier let slip on TV, I think he was doing work for Amazon, this U.S. Open, mm -hmm. that the USTA decided to slow down the courts to benefit American players. And people are like, what the hell? What? Like, didn't we just have an all-woman, all-U.S. woman semifinal last year mm -hmm. at the U.S. Open? But what they really mean to say is we're going to benefit the U.S. men. But like, I mean, wheels are turning. I'm trying to do like formulas and shit in my head. Like, I cannot wrap my head around it. And why, if, why would it benefit? I don't get it. But if, it, if <laughs> how bad are the U.S. men <laughs> that you need to completely fuck over everybody else I'm like, in the draw I thought to try would... and have them win one more round? I don't understand. Right. Like, so John Isner gets to the quarterfinals quarter. instead of the fourth round? Like, John Isner just made the semis of a fast court of, of Wimbledon. I, I don't get it. I guess he could benefit from the extra time because his movement is not as strong. I get that. There's the but... other argument that the, the courts are slowed and it's what we've seen with the homogenization of tennis courts over the last decade and a half, mm -hmm. that it, it makes for better TV. You get longer rallies, it becomes more entertaining for fans. But at what cost? Is at the... the cost of the players' bodies, frankly. Right. But I felt that this U.S. Open had a real lack of memorable matches except for the ones that rafa played right I, I mean rafa and team is 
to me, the only potential classic out of this entire tournament. Well, classic, yes, but the Hachanov match was very good as well. Yeah, yeah. But I found the men's final, save for some of the second set, quite boring. It's just that, like, it felt like the, the result was never in doubt because Novak was playing incredibly well, hitting very few errors. Del Potro's shot against Novak is to overpower him, especially with the forehand. And it felt like his his shots were just not penetrating that well on this court. I could be misreading it totally, but I don't know. Like, after two weeks of this, I was just not really that into it. Like, it's too much. I d- Who wants to see these endless rallies? There, there has to be a, a middle ground. Big props to Dominic team. Before that match, you said to me, Dominic is looks like he's going to bring it tonight. And he brought it. <laughs> it was brought in. <laughs> That first set, I mean, do we need to? Do we even need to talk about it again? It, it was Dominic alarming. Team bageled Rafael Nadal, and it was earned. Like mm-hmm. Dominic came with a game plan and executed it to a T. His, I mean, he was hitting with incredible power. He was working his way to the net. He just like stunned Rafa in the first set. He also would not miss. What mm. what people don't realize perhaps about Dominic, is that he is one of the most powerful players in all of tennis. Mm -hmm. What he can do on his serve, he consistently serves in the 130s. The forehand is enormous. And you would think conventional wisdom, having a one-handed backhand, that he wouldn't be able to redline with it that much. But he can hit flat from any position on the court with that backhand. Mm -hmm. And if you were looking for a match that had the thrills the late night drama the five sets the the classic us open under the lights humdinger this was it Mm -hmm. by the time rafa gets to the semifinals we'd seen signs throughout the tournament that he was favoring the knee a taping appeared on his knee in one of his earlier matches and then it disappeared he didn't look hindered in subsequent matches and then there are certain points against team i mean obviously the first set bagel where you're wondering like how much of this is dominic and how much of it is mm-hmm. perhaps rafa is not at his best then rafa is able to to find his way through to the end of that match but by the time he gets to the semi-final he's played what 16 hours on court from five matches mm-hmm. that's a lot for somebody at his age and somebody who is at this event struggling with his knee it was clear early in the match against el potro that he was not there Like, he was clearly in a very bad mood, emotionally, and physically, it became clearer and clearer as the match went on. He was not moving well, he was not bending at the net, he was letting balls go that he would never let go. And, of course, again, this is not to take anything away from Juan Martin, who played an excellent two weeks here, and may have won that match regardless of Nadal's health. Like, of course, we have no idea. But... The tendonitis has flared up again, and you wonder sometimes, like, is it going to affect him for one match and then be fine the next day? It's not one of those things that, you know, it's a really unpredictable injury. He's pulled out of Davis Cup. He was scheduled to play Davis Cup next weekend. In his press conference, Rafa was, he pushed back against the idea that this was something that was a new injury, that it was something that could be a long-term injury. He said, it's something I know exactly how to deal with. And I could be fine tomorrow. It could take a couple weeks for me to feel like I'm back to my fighting best. He didn't seem to be too alarmed by it, but he was absolutely devastated by it. Mm. And it's crazy to me how quickly, in the span of, what, two months, the landscape of men's tennis has changed. All of a sudden, Federer is losing matches that he would not normally lose in Mm. the last two years. And the Fedal dominance of men's tennis is a little bit wobbly. And we have Djokovic back into the fold. Murray, while he lost early in this event, he seems to be on the mend. Vavrinka is coming back. Del Potro is there again. It's it's another tonal shift right. in men's tennis within a short period of time when it was totally different just a couple months ago. I mean, with the way Djokovic is playing, it, it feels like 2015 again. It's like Nadal and Federer are second and third best. Djokovic is clearly the best player at the moment, won the last two majors, is the favorite going into the 
uh, Asian hardcore swing to win every tournament he enters. It's crazy, but Djokovic could be year in number one. <laughs> that is insane. It's insane. Yes, but it is possible. Let's wait into this Pliskova thing. It'll yeah. have to be a little bit abridged. We thought that this was going to be the see what happened was right. of this episode. I thought this was going to be the drama of the whole tournament. Doesn't it seem quaint at this point? <laughs> ben Rothenberg published a story ahead of Pliskova and Serena's quarterfinal match, wherein Karolina Pliskova had some quotes that got people upset mm-hmm. about Serena. She said, quote, she was screaming, and it's like, what is she doing? She has all the respect from me, but I can beat her, so I'm not worried about her. Unquote for a second. That's fine. Like, that's fine. You, you know, if you're facing Serena, if you're facing any top player, you should want to beat her. And you should believe that you can beat her. Listen. So I don't get beat, why people would be mad about that. You beat Venus and Serena back to back. Well. On right? that court a couple of years ago. Like, you did that. Yeah. Wear it. But Exactly. I mean, if you don't think you can beat them, why are you not? Here? Why are you out here at all? But then, because she... that's the critique a lot of these women. You know, folks say, "Oh, they show up on court and then they're they're rabbit." Mm-hmm. These these women can't be top players because they don't have the cojones when it <laughs> when it comes down to it. So all that is is fine. What really upset people was she said she has a big game, but sometimes she behaves bigger than her game is. Again, weird. I I had a little fun with her. I poked some fun. It was fine. Was it fine? <laughs> <laughs> well, it got it got very ugly eventually. I because... totally stayed out of this because from my Reddit, it it was it seemed very clear to me that this was not to be interpreted literally. Right. Right. You know, like, <laughs> and also keep in mind the way it was circulated to, it was a previewed and a tweet linked to and then a screenshot of this section from the article mm-hmm. clearly highlighting this segment it it was designed to sell yeah uh, we're making that oprah shrugging gif right now but, and <laughs> and when i say that and when we make that shrug <laughs> at this point i'm like what are y'all doing like why well, why are you taking this bait you took the bait that's the thing. why are you taking the mm-hmm. bait like we it's so why are we so quick to believe that Pliskova is out here trying to snatch Serena's wig in this regard? You know, like, if you read it, it doesn't make any sense. And if it doesn't make any sense to you, it's because she's speaking mm. English as a second language. Right. And then so you go and think, what does she mean? And it, is, it, is, is it her job to curate how she's represented in print by somebody else? Mm. It's not. And how this article is presented to you? Wow. Uh, I mean... I mean, I don't have a problem with having some fun with Pliskova's reputation. Fine. You know. I mean, you were you went off with the lumberjacking and that is deserved. Exactly. Like that that's deserving of rehashing all the I mean, time. I thought it was funny, but then it came out after the match she was seen crying in press. So again, people had a field day with that. To me that's too far. Before I even knew what she was crying about, it was like, you know, Serena won. It's fine. Like it's over. Just mm-hmm. move on. And then it came out well, that her... Well, you said it to me, and you're like, oh, but she was crying in press. And I was like... Yeah, what and I was felt she... bad. Yeah, but I said to you, what was she crying about? Like, this doesn't seem like something to be crying about. Right. It's just, this is kind of crazy to me. Mm-hmm. It was a routine loss to Serena. What I know of Pliskova, like, this doesn't seem to be the thing that a quarterfinal of the U.S. Open would bring her to tears. Mm-hmm. Especially so that... because she has not been playing well all year. That it... This was a good achievement for her to get yeah. to the quarterfinals. So then it turns out that her father-in-law had passed away very soon before the match. I don't know if it was that day or the day before, but it was really, really fresh. And so at that point, it's like, okay, it's fine. It's over. Like, you need to move on. I don't care what she said. <laughs> you know, like, it's not, it's really not that serious at this point. This is real. Like, what's happening in her family is real. But to go back to it, she says she has a big game, but sometimes she behaves bigger than her game is. What What is it that people took that to mean? When I read that, I took it to mean, well, A, something's lost in translation here, and B, that the way it comes on the back of her talking about the screaming and whatnot, that I read it as, you know, yeah, the game is there and it's, it's prodigious or whatever, like, it's Serena, it's her game. Mm. But somehow the screaming is, like, meant to intimidate you and she's not going to be intimidated. That was the gist of what I got right. from it. 
But I can understand when people read this and are triggered. It, it's this whole like intimidation thing that mm-hmm. Serena needs this to to win. That she behaves a certain way. That like in a lot of ways, it's a dog whistle to folks. Right. And the thing with dog whistles is that sometimes they're purposeful and sometimes they're not. Yeah. <laughs> and in this situation, I don't think Carolina knew what the hell she was doing. That doesn't mean you can't take. Uh, take umbrage with what was said but I, I don't think that's where it was coming from the reaction didn't meet the crime is <laughs> well it, it really blew my mind <laughs> especially considering the oprah shrug <laughs> <laughs> yeah like can we just have a do a little bit more have a little bit more due diligence in the future mm-hmm. there's and as we saw heading into championship weekend and the final there will always be something to go to bat for and to be justifiably outraged about. Mm. Like, we need to pick our battles. Yeah. I think we need to put this US Open to bed. And <laughs> we talked about it, and now I never want to talk about it again. Literally. I suspect we'll be getting some well, mentions on our Twitter <laughs> some fan, in the next couple some of days. Some fan mail? Uh, might be a little bit of hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to the show. My name is Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And I'm James. I'm at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. I'm going to put this in for a bad toss. Thanks for listening to us and helping us get to the bottom of this situation. Oh, right. (laughs) She likes how you say the word bottom. Bottom. Right. That's not how I say it. So, bad toss, you've gotten now three uses yes. of me saying how bottom. many bottoms would you like <laughs> the, the podcast can be found on twitter at the body serve similarly on instagram give us a review on itunes we love to hear all feedback that you have for us via email at the body serve at gmail.com or any other social media till next time thank you thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>